Your sensors are correct. Do not adjust your heading. Your heading. You've discovered the Omega Particle. Streaming to the Alpha Quadrant and beyond. 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 Here's your host. The Anchorman of the Federation. The Doctor of Dilithium. This is Jonathan Wiegand. Yes, like the man said, I am your gracious host, Jonathan Wiegand, and I'm so happy to be here. And I absolutely am tickled pink and cannot wait to get into DS9 with all of you lovely people here. And in, in case anybody was wondering, if you're sitting there, how, how many episodes is DS9 and how long will this whole review take? And there are 176 episodes <laughs> of Deep Space Nine, and if we did a weekly review, you know, we expect to finish sometime in the age of 2026, 2027, so we're in here for the long haul, buckle up, uh, because it's going to be a lot of fun, and it's going to be a, a fun growing experience, not only my own life and your own lives, but podcasts as well, so there's going to be a lot to be accomplished. Over the next three years, I still can't believe that I'm I'm undertaking this, but I think it's going to be so much fun. So if you're if you're a long time listener of OPP of the program, you know when I started this humble podcast, it'd be four years in February of 2020. I was in a basement, just hanging up towels, trying to get the freaking uh, reverb and sound to hit just right and. Um, that was almost 96 episodes ago. When I first started, I, as a fan, I always hated how there were so few Star Trek podcasts that did just reviews. That's all they would do. If they would be like, all right, we're going to do the original series. We're going to do TNG. We're going to do Voyager. We're going to do Deep Space Nine. And they, they wouldn't really come up with anything else. There would Because Star Trek is such a deep, like deeper and deeper. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's such a deep and plentiful fan like fandom that you could I mean you could do so much stuff so for me I hated that so I feel like after you know 95 plus episodes let's round up to 100 episodes of just doing a bunch of random things species content I was like you know what maybe now it's the time to dip our toe into the golden age of Trek so why not start out with my favorite series Deep Space Nine so after much debate here in the OPP headquarters, the bunker on the eastern coast of the United States, between the staff and I, we were we were landlocked. So we decided let's put it to a vote on Instagram. And thank you all so much for that. By the way, we're over twenty thousand, which is unbelievable. Um, and the response was very surprising from the voting that we had. So eighty-two percent of people voted with a resounding yes. And I think there was a couple hundred votes, like three or four hundred votes in that contest. So I think that's a good amount. I will say this as a pretense. Do not fret. We will still be doing, you know, normal content, news and brews, just the fun, random stuff you've come to expect from us. But we're still going to be doing some Deep Space Nine in the free time. So a little bit more relaxed fit with the Deep Space Nines. But still a lot of fun. And and speaking of doing other topics outside of Deep Space Nine, little uh, harmless plug for the part two of our Sir Patrick Stewart Making It So memoir review. And we'll be finishing up our, our Trek recap and review. And just a little sneak peek for you guys. So there were so many actors he worked with on the Royal Shakespeare Company that he eventually worked with on Star Trek. And one of those being from Chain of Command. The Cardassian who was like, there are how many lights? Five lights? And Parkhart's like, there are four lights. That's a famous Shakespearean actor. That's a little tidbit for next week. Without further ado, let's get into Deep Space Nine. And whether it's your 10th watch through or your very first one, please watch along with us every week. And let's get into Emissary Part 1 and Part 2. To start things off, Benjamin Sisko, 
is a very intense <laughs> and has a palpable anger about himself that sets himself apart in the world of Star Trek captains. When you think of Star Trek captains, John Luke Picard comes to mind. He's not the most warmest person, you know, in the first few seasons. His demeanor was very more about discomfort and irritability than outright anger, which kind of makes sense now because we see how un- how uncomfortable and, and uneasy Sir Patrick Stewart was in the uh, first few years of filming. Another famous captain, James T. Kirk from the original series, he was an all around, you know, affable guy. Now we have our new commander in Deep Space Nine, and not only is he breaking the mold by, you know, being African American, he's also carrying around this unrelenting rage with him. And he has literally every right to be angry. <laughs> I would be just like him. I mean, let's think about it. He has his reasons. First, he's the first Trek lead with a legitimately tragic past. His wife, Jennifer, died three years ago. Worse than dying, if I can say that, is that she died during the Borg's attack on the Federation at Wolf 359, which decimated the fleet. And that attack was led by Lacutus, AKA briefly assimilated Captain Picard. So it's really tough <laughs> Not to be angry in that situation because Emissary starts off with Cisco meeting Picard. I know there's these kind of two semi-confrontational scenes between the two of them. I don't know if it was because they wanted DS9 to kind of get that proximity mojo from TNG because TNG was, I think, in the sixth or seventh season when DS9 came out. So they were like, oh, well, also Picard's on DS9. Check it out. So I don't know if they were trying to do that or, or what. It seems like almost a gambit to me something they could show on the commercials to get TNG folks in. But I will say Cisco and Avery Brooks, the brilliant actor who plays Cisco, does the whole barely restrained sediment very well. I mean, I completely understand the resentment towards Picard. Like this dude, single-handedly, in the mind of Benjamin Cisco, was single-handedly responsible for the death of his wife. And this, again, is according to Cisco. Because Picard had it was assimilated, that knowledge helped the Borg wipe out that fleet, and then his wife died because the Borg knew all of the Federation secrets. And however, on the flip side of the coin, we know anyone familiar enough with Picard and TNG and know the resolution of the best of both worlds already know Picard has suffered for it and how little any of what happened was his fault. And if you don't know TNG history, it's unlikely you'll be enthused by a protagonist kind of growling at this guest star. Another great aspect of this whole like semi-confrontation between Cisco and Picard that we see at the beginning of the episode and the end of the episode is that the obvious discomfort the man feels within the framework of the Federation is, is very important. Let's back up a little bit. So Cisco isn't precisely an outsider. He explains to Picard early on. He begins this episode nearly convinced he should leave Starfleet for good and take up the civilian life back on Earth. He's been on one starbase for three years, you know, kind of lamenting and grieving, it sounds like. And it's not exactly surprising when he changes his mind before the end credits because spending an hour and a half introducing a protagonist only to have him just, like, go off into the sunset isn't really good TV writing and is super confusing. But what's more important was that he was thinking about quitting. And that's kind of what I wanted to to land at. Because it certainly sets a tone. We see with Kirk and Picard, they were defined by their commitment, defined by their loyalty to the Federation, to Starfleet, to the crew of the Enterprise. And with Sisko, it's really not like that. Or maybe not yet. He has no real ties to the Federation, ties to Starfleet. hes It's almost kind of like he's putting in his time on that Starbase just so he can be like, well, I'm going to quit. I don't want to be on the you know frontier out here next to this random planet. Who cares? <laughs> As we know, he changes his mind. But this, this whole idea of him not being 100% into Starfleet indicates a big shift that kind of runs throughout the entirety of this episode. The 
you know, the people we meet here, and, you know, they're obviously not all humans. There's some very uh, new aliens and diverse aliens here. They're not uniformly happy. They're not satisfied with their jobs, not satisfied with their standing. They're not even excited to be working together. (laughs) And Cisco really isn't the only angry member of the cast. And the tension these various frustrations create when they collide against each other shows promise and shows what the eventual drama and, and character crashing and character development will eventually become. So up until now, Starfleet has really focused on individuals coming together for a purpose greater than themselves. And DS9 most likely will still be about that, and it is still about that to some extent, but it's still a kind of a different ensemble. Because now we have people on the show, main characters, that have their own goals, have their own needs, have their own motivations and desires. And so it's not like on a starship where everybody has working towards the same goal, working towards the same team as a as a group. Now it's kind of like, well, we're, we all live together, but we all going to kind of do our own thing. And I think great drama comes from the opposition of understandable viewpoints. And there's a lot of potential even in this episode. I will say I wish we did that more. I wish the writers did that more in this first episode, but... We did a lot in The Mystical, and we had a lot of time on our hands with The Mystical, no pun intended. So if this is your first time running through DS9, it is good to be excited about how the pilot is set up for future character interactions. For me, The Emissary, part one and two, these pilot episodes, you know, they kind of have a lot of baggage around them and I usually honestly skip them whenever I do my personal like rewatch of the series because this this episode is is part one and two so it's double long so it's an hour and a half long and most of the length is given over to kind of what I call table setting you get that usually in you know new series premiere it's kind of that meat and potatoes uh you kind of set up this character this character this character this is their motivation this is what they're going to be doing there's nothing wrong with that Because, I mean, it's very important, you know, to meet the ensemble, establish a primary setting, introduce potential conflicts, you know, some that is going to pay off in later episodes and some which won't even pay off at all, even going to be forgotten before the end of the season. Specifically with Emissary, there's a great story arc that helps bring everyone together in the face of a common enemy. That temporary cooperation, which is not going to preclude arguments and contention down the line, at least indicates, you know, that our heroes and anti-heroes are capable of working together even if they don't want to. So Emissary, so this is a segment of of the review called Hit the Ground Running. Emissary debuted in 1993. It's right in the middle of TNG's, was that the sixth season? Did you look that up, Luna? Right, the sixth season. Luna the intern, everybody. And there's kind of a in my opinion, a level of professionalism right off the bat, which wasn't present in TNG's first episode. In Encounter at Farpoint, Farpoint had a lot to do. It had to reintroduce Trek to television audiences after a 20-year absence, and then also convince an audience that they could enjoy Star Trek without Kirk and Spock, or the rest of the Enterprise. And DS9 comes to us in a world where all of this is basically a given. Star Trek Next Generation is a massive hit it is a cultural phenomenon they are just enjoying the ride so they don't have to set everything up like tng did way back in the day when they started the trekverse was an established commodity and to me that confidence shows and it's clear these actors they're going to get more comfortable as, as the roles go deeper and go longer but there's kind of this gratifying lack of clumsiness that we see in the early TNG episodes if you watch them. So it just seems like they're benefiting so much of the Trekverse they're coming into. And something I really haven't noticed before um, when I rewatched it this week. And, and Emissary's plot, at least the, you know, the non-Emissary elements, works in the standard nuts and bolts type of way. Like I said a couple minutes earlier, it's very meat and potatoes. And we learn about these underdogs that can kick ass. We see Cisco arriving at a station, and he learns that Chief Miles O'Brien, played by Kalamini, which, you know, he was cast off TNG as the uh, transporter chief, 
And it, to me, it was such a smart choice for the show because O'Brien was like a welcome presence on the Enterprise, but he didn't get a lot of time to himself. But it's so cool now because we see him back, but also kind of immediately set up opposition with the Cardis because we learned he was on set like three. And then we see Cisco's first officer, Major Kiro, played by the great Dana Vister. You know, she's Bajoran. She's got this chip on her shoulder. And truth be told, hardly anyone on the station is all excited to have a new Federation representative to boss them around. I really loved how it showed the flip side of the universe and the flip side of the Alpha Quadrant saying like, oh, the Federation isn't this beloved all organization. Just to recap, if you don't remember the... Cardassians were quote unquote occupying. <laughs> it's not more like just devastating. And we'll get into this in future seasons, but the literal Nazis to Bajorans, they were eventually, you know, kicked out by the Bajoran resistance and they left. And so the Federation came in to kind of keep the Cardassians away. Just again, a quick recap. So the fact that the Federation's in, they're like, oh, this is another occupying force. This is another outside force is going to dictate Bajoran interests, and we're not going to have any choice. We're just going to be, you know, trampled again. So a great, off the top, a great premise to start off with. Because, again, understandable viewpoints and relatable viewpoints just have bring in so much potential conflicts. We all can agree with Major Kira. Like, yeah, I would definitely feel that way if I was in her situation. And then on top of that, we have the Cardassians, who are these tricky buttholes, to say the least. Do you know they haven't really left? They're just kind of staying on the edge of the quadrant, kind of just waiting for an excuse to snoop in and start shooting up the place. And after such a comparative stability in the next generation, you know, where bad things happened, but there was a status quo to return to. DS9 gives us a, a world that needs more than, you know, speeches and idealism to get back on the track. The stat, as we'll learn, and this is your first time watching through, sometimes the status quo constantly changes. It's really comforting because it kind of mirrors the real world, and the best sci fi is sci fi that comments and mirrors the real world. So that's one of the reasons I love it too, because things happen and then the consequences. You're not just going to be magically whisked away and then completely forgotten about i have a few minor complaints with emissary and a one big one the small stuff you know is expected being a pilot the the dialogue is very heavy-handed in spots and you know some of the performances aren't quite there yet uh, i i love avery brooks as cisco and yeah he was occasionally awkward at the beginning but he's kind of not really sure to where to put his feet and in his defense i will say he is asked to do a lot of heavy lifting over the course of an hour and a half it, he's even supposed to act crazy and going on the beach with his his wife and teleport all over time and back so it's just i feel like it was him in front of a green screen for a, a good majority of time and moving on to kira i know i mean she's an intense character but vister's intensity can border to me almost on hysteria and then, of course, we see Alexander Siddings Bashir. He's most remembered of this episode to me because he kind of just hits on Jazia literally right out of the airlock. Not even an exaggeration. Right out of the airlock, he's like, hey, can we go get dinner or drink sometimes? And again, super awkward, but who would do that? It's, it, it is difficult to introduce a cast this large without a certain level of, hey, let's stop and explain what's going on. And let's stop and explain ourselves, though. And while it's not perfect, to me, there are no obvious weak links here. Obviously, there's no concerns because, A, I know how the series goes out, but there's really no concerns about the, the years ahead from this cast. Like, they're all going to grow beautifully. Kind of going back to this TNG comparison, it really relied on Patrick Stewart's talent and presence to help carry so much of the the first couple seasons you know it was kind of an inexperienced unproven cast but ds9's ensemble is fairly deep even on the very first introduction uh, brooks again is essentially awesome i already know the like, sadig will get more to do as the show goes on and vister is a little corny but i appreciate her passion and i appreciate the show also has two very strong female leads right off the bat which is something that the golden age of Trek really has struggled with since its incarnation. And well, I don't say golden age, but all of Trek has struggled with its incarnation. We get a little bit 
more representation in Voyager with with Captain Janeway and of course Seven of Nine, Blana Taurus, but then also with Discovery and all the other shows that come out, kind of the episode of New Trek. Terry Farrell's Dax, to me, carries herself with an appropriate self-assurance, you know, of a creature who's been alive for 300 years. <laughs> she just has that swag, and that's that has to be very hard on day one to come off. So that's a very good job of her. And then, uh, rest in peace, Renee Abergeons does excellent work under the long lot of the makeup and the ambiguous Odo. And I know he's kind of, it was a little awkward when he just kind of like dumps on everybody. I have a mysterious past. I don't know where I'm from. Like, it's like, okay, we, we get it, bro. But he just kind of has to like info dump on us. And and this is so interesting. I wanted to talk about this in my notes. So Armin Shimmerman, you know, is the first Ferengi, major Ferengi. He plays Quark. He has that TNG early Ferengi, like hissing, like and the in the teeth and his makeup is very like dark lines and, and shadowing so it just reminds me of that first encounter with Riker on that planet when the Frankie had the whips you know what I mean from TNG so he he carries that over and eventually that that's gone but this is the first time I've watched it again for for in years so I was like oh my gosh they just literally were like all right let's keep this same kind of mode of the Frankies that we had on TNG and quick fact if you didn't know the Frankies were actually supposed to be the main villain in the next generation but they came off as super silly and they just decided on the board because the frankie kind of fell out quark to me right off the bat is fun he may be greedy and treacherous as a frankie but he wasn't like sniveling or cowardly and this is clearly a show that enjoys having as much gray area as it can and we're going to see that in the years to come and it's great. And I'm very excited to start this rewatch with you guys. And we can, of course, leave out Colomini. He's so great. He's always great. He's he's like the foundation of the show. And to me, he should have been Oscar nominated for his work in Con Air. Yes, that famous Nicolas Cage movie of the late 1990s. He played an amazing role in Con Air. And I just think, you know, he's never got his just desserts for his acting chops but you no know, he i had a chance to see him on broadway luna did i tell you that yeah we went to new york like i don't know like in 2015 2016 and he was on broadway we almost got tickets but it was sold out and i was very disappointed either way these just fascinating individuals kind of crammed on this station and i'm very excited because none of them are perfect none of them are the ideal person that we see on tng or these other star trek shows so to kind of see these drives and insecurity kind of bounce off one another is very exciting. The conflict and the character uh, development is going to be off the charts. Like I said, I had one big issue besides, you know, some of the little corny meat and potatoes acting. And the big issue and biggest reservation about Emissary, oh boy, is the part of the story that gives, you know, the episode its title. And it's the revelation that Commander Sisko is a prophesied connection between the people of Bajor and a group of aliens living inside a nearby wormhole. So for the first 20 or so minutes of the show, it kind of just moves along at a decent clip. It's a little rough around the edges and maybe a little clumsy, but clearly setting down the necessary tracks to get the train rolling. And then Cisco meet, goes to meet with a Bajoran religious leader, Kaiopaka, and she shows him the tear of the prophet. And this is when things get stagnant. Like, you leave a bag of Doritos, but you don't roll it up and put the clip on. And you come back three days later, is this stale? Like, it's still, uh, it's food, but you don't want to eat it. And it's not, like, again, it's not awful exactly. It's just really unnecessary, the deep dive we're about to go into, into the emissary. And, I, I mean, Cisco already has his hands full with dealing with the Cardassian problems, dealing with the Bajoran integration into the into the station and just also in his personal life moving his son for the first time in three years since his wife and and Jake's mother's death so there's that part and he he doesn't need a lot of mystical clap clapping clap back as the young people say you know we have these long flashbacks and and then we get into this debate over the nature of time again we don't really need it we it could have been summarized like in five minutes it didn't need to be this a very elongated thing 
Um, so that's my main gripe with this episode. And I'm sure you guys were watching. I was playing on my phone for, for some of it because it's just, okay, let's move along. We know, okay, they'll eventually understand time is linear. Okay, let's go. But the best parts, we talked about what I didn't like, but the best parts of DS9's first episode kind of take some of TNG's strongest conceits, the the importance of consequences, the the difficulties in negotiating strong relationships between different species with different ideals, and expanding on them without shying away from the darker side of compromise and, and playing politics. And the, the, the greatness of DS9 isn't there yet, but there are hints of it throughout, most notably in the fact that there is a show about sticking around after the adventures are over and after, you know, these first contact ambassadors have left. And again, this is in the 93, so this is something we've never seen in Star Trek. We only see the big climactic, you know, meetings and then cut to black. So this is really cool to kind of see a cut to black and what happens, you know, when everything chills out and everybody goes home. As just a small recap again, the Federation is considering Bajor for membership, and now it's up to Cisco to hang out with a few other officers and try to rebuild, you know, with some of the locals, rebuild this membership. And there's just kind of a rawness there that speaks to the, the why the show is so good is that it makes these individuals say, look, you're going to have to rise above your prejudices and fears, and you're going to have to become a functioning team. And if you do, that'll be enough to weather the trials. But can you do it? And we see it a little bit. And again, that's what we see makes the first episode so great. We see them band together and beat the Cardassians back. But I think that's exciting stuff. And plus, one of my favorite parts of the episode is watching Cisco negotiate these backroom deals necessary to get Deep Space Nine up and running. And that always sold me because I was like, okay, this is not the typical Picard and Kirk like this guy is going to do what it takes to get the job done and again going to Quark being like look your nephew's going to go to jail or you can stay those are your options so he's basically playing politics and twisting his arm which is something we really haven't seen a commander or a captain do yet but again this kind of whole orbs is an emissary long drawn out explanation is the weakest part of the episode so out of all the Trek pilots I've seen, DS9 is probably the one that is most rife with possibility. You know, the setting's unusual, the cast is strong, the conflicts are there, everything just needs a little bit more flesh, the foundation's built up beautifully, and I appreciate right from the start there's a story which isn't going to be resolved anytime soon. And again, at, up to this point, Star Trek has always been a episodic series. It was... One episode, start and end. One episode, start and end. And TNG kind of introduced a little bit different, where it's like, okay, we're going to have maybe two longer story arcs, but not a seasonal Stark. Not, you know, maybe with the Borg, that was a little bit, but nothing in the universe that DS9 is currently and will be currently doing across seven seasons. It's going to be really fun to watch that. And again, there's no reset buttons here. There's no convenient forgetting... This is intense serialization from the start, and DS9 is embracing that. We get to see what happens next, and I, for one, am so excited. That has been our review for Emissary Part 1 and 2. Thank you all so much for joining. And Luna, let's wrap it up. Thank you all so much for listening. Uh, It was great kind of going over Emissary Part 1 and Part 2 with you guys. It was awesome. I'm very excited to get this train a-rolling. It's going to be awesome. Oh, man. I just can't. This is... I am busting at the seams. I've been doing that with uh, making a memoir reviews. Again, we're coming out uh, early next week, so look for Part 2. But And then getting it to DS9. So it's going to be a lot of fun, everybody. Thank you all so much for listening. Again... Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. It's so important. Helps the podcast so much. Always feel free to reach out on Instagram. Uh, it's where I usually am most of my days now, or, or Facebook, or, or Twitter, or, or is it X now, or X, whatever. Love debating with you guys, talking with you guys about the shows, and 
characters and etc so it's been so much fun and so rewarding to me hearing from you guys so it's one of my favorite part about being and producing a podcast is just yeah connecting with you people out there all over the world anyway remember to take care of yourselves keep that mental health in check and strong you're important we need you here wherever you're at and as always second start of the right straight on till morning